All right, man. We'll jump right in because um, we actually Tiff has a doctor's appointment in 58 minutes. So okay. <laughs> I'm like her chauffeur right now for this stuff. Yeah. Uh, are you you're still affiliated with Gennady Golovkin and, and Roman Gonzalez, right? Yes, uh, with Roman, um, you know, good relationship with uh, Mr. Honda and Tycoon Promotions, and uh, happy to help them uh, whenever. Whenever uh, that comes up, and also with uh, Triple G, uh, you know, helping them on the promotional side, and also, uh, you know, took the lead with uh, Ali Akhmedov. He had a nice win on that uh, Triple G Canelo show. Yeah, I just I wanted to establish that up front because there's always people online saying that, uh, you know, you don't work with those guys anymore, but of, of course you do. You're, you're involved. And um, you mentioned that Triple G Canelo. Uh, the trilogy fight they're calling it. I wanted to jump back to that. And of course, we'll we'll look at some things coming up. But uh, what were your thoughts about the performance? Um, a lot of people criticized Canelo's performance, saying he looked a little bit flat. A lot of people criticized Gennady's performance, saying he looked old. Um, what, what were your general impressions of the fight? You know, I would have liked to have seen uh, Gennady start a little bit earlier in the fight in terms of, uh, taking control of the fight. Um, uh, I, I think he won, uh, one or two of the early rounds, but, uh, definitely, uh, the last four rounds. And, uh, if he would have just, uh, started that momentum a little bit earlier, um, I think that would have been uh, more convincing. I think this is the first time that Canelo actually uh, legitimately won the fight up in, uh, up yeah. in Las Vegas. Yeah. So yeah, I give him credit for that. Um, uh, you know, there's no secret that uh, Triple G is 40 years old, and I, I don't think anyone at 40 is able to fight at the skill level or a, at the uh, level in boxing that he's fighting at right now. He's fighting, a, he fought a 32-year-old Canelo in his prime and um, in one, uh, lost a, uh, a narrow decision by, uh, what was it, 7-5 on two, two judges' scorecards. So, um, you know, going to Japan, beating, uh, beating, uh, Murata. beating Murata, the WBA champion over there, uh, at the time. I mean, that's, that's a, that was a huge victory for uh, triple G. So that, that shows exactly where he's at. And I saw your tweet, Michael, and I appreciate your insight on these type of things. Cause you followed uh, triple G for quite a long time. You know, the backstory about all the people that, uh, were offered uh, major paydays, you know, career high paydays, and just refused to, refused to take the fight, or even worse, uh, vacated their titles not to take the fight. So you know, uh, un unlike uh, some of the critics uh, on social media that aren't familiar with the backstory, why didn't you fight this guy or that guy or whatever it is? Is uh, you can only make a fight if two people want to fight, mm -hmm. uh, and you offer fair conditions on uh, on both sides. And and uh, what you you put it into perspective about where Canelo is at. And uh, what was it? Canelo stopped C Caleb Plant, knocked him out, and also stopped uh, Billy Joe Saunders, yep. who both guys are much younger than Triple G. So if Triple G can lose uh, a close decision or, say, a competitive decision to Canelo, that shows you that, you know, if Canelo is one of the top pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the sport today, which I would uh, classify him as, mm -hmm. um, you know, Triple G is just a step uh, below him. So at 40 years old, I guarantee you, at 40, Canelo's not going to look anywhere near <laughs> what right. Triple G is looking at right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yeah, it's Stephen Breadman Edwards. I got to give him a shout out. I don't know if you saw his tweet where he compared what Gennady's doing to uh, Carlos Monzon and to Marvin Hagler and just how old they were at the end of their career and what it would be if they had stuck around till they were 40 and fought the equivalent of Canelo. And it was really, really telling. Um I got to ask you about this. I've had several people. Of course, I wasn't there for this one. I wish I could have been. I was there for the first two, right? Kind of kind of, you know, took over the party in the first one, <laughs> but after the first one. But, um, you know, I have a pregnant wife. It, it is what it is. <laughs> but um, I've heard that the day before the fight, before the weigh-in, there was a closed-door weigh-in the morning of uh, Friday – I can't remember the day. I think September 16th it would have been. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of this? What, what happened there? I mean, that's pretty standard uh, these days in, in boxing, I think. Uh, we we uh, started doing that with the Triple G fights just because 
uh, and, and we didn't have, uh, I wasn't in plan. I wasn't involved in the planning for this fight. I'm just saying that it's, it's not uncommon because you get the fighters on the scale. They weigh in officially with the commission, with all the officials there, with both teams representatives there, and then they can go eat. And then they do kind of a, uh, public, uh, uh, public weigh in, uh, type of thing. So, uh, you know, for the fans and the media and they can do interviews. Uh, UFC has been doing that for a long time, very effectively. Um, and with the fighters, it's much more effective because then they're not pressed to, okay, now I have to go eat something quickly and right. cut media obligations short. So there was no conspiracies or anything like that okay, good. Uh, behind it. That was, uh, the commission was there and both teams were there and it was on the schedule, the internal schedule. And so, uh, I know people like to read into things like that for some reason, but that's the, the only reason for it is uh, so the fighters can officially weigh in and then go eat and then they can have much more time to do their media obligations. Uh, one comment on that, though, that I'd like to put is if you remember in the Danny Jacobs fight. Um, in New you know, York. Yeah. Yeah. It's one thing if both guys weigh in, whether it's early or whatever it is, if they weigh in at the same time and they have the same amount of time to rehydrate before the fight, then that's an even playing field. When one fighter and the IBF actually changed the rules specifically because of that fight, where one fighter had agreed to a second day weigh-in and then strategically uh, decided not to show up because he'd been eating the whole time since the first weigh-in and the second fighter has to still watch their weight, mm -hmm. then that gives, uh, you know, in that specific instance, uh, gave Danny a huge advantage, uh, probably a 10-pound advantage uh, coming into that fight um over uh, over triple g so that that's the only comment on that but uh, when both guys weigh in at the same time then there's no issues in terms of you know one guy might put on a lot more weight than the other person but as long as they're you know on the level playing field in terms of timing for recovery and everything like that i think everything's fine with that okay i just want you to put that on record because if i say it <laughs> you know it just, so I, I just wanted you to put that out there um yeah th that was a situation where again both both camps uh agreed to the terms the commission was there so zero shadiness so zero shadiness with this third fight we can say that right i, I think people are so used to controversy as it relates to the canelo golovkin story that they just had to create something here in this third one to me the story was what you alluded to earlier a 40-year-old man who is a natural fighter, doesn't bend the rules like some other fighters. We saw today a fight got blown up because yeah. of, uh, or I, I think it still actually might happen between Ben and Eubank. Um, when you see a guy at 40 who does it the right way, competing at the level Golovkin's competing at, it's pretty special. Where does he go from here? He, he's still got two belts at middleweight. Um, no doubt he wants to defend those belts. Where do you see him going in 2023? I think you got to put things into perspective. I think uh, Triple G has an all-time great uh, career, especially everything he accomplished at middleweight, uh, fighting the guys that would actually get in the ring with him and even going out of his way. I remember the Martin Murray fight. Martin Murray couldn't get a visa in the United States, and nobody wanted to fight Martin at that time that wasn't forced to. I remember when Martin went to Argentina and knocked right. out Joe Martinez twice and only got credit for one, and probably lucky he didn't get credit for the other one. <laughs> I think there would have been a riot there. I don't know if they yeah. would have gotten out safely uh, from that from that crowd. But, um, you know, he was the best guy at the time that we could get in the ring with Triple G. He was a, a top five middleweight, very tough guy. Like I said, nobody wanted to fight him. And, and we actually made the accommodation to fight him in Monaco, uh, which is a special place for Triple G's fought there uh, three times. Right. And, um, you know, but I'm saying if you put things in perspective, what he's accomplished. And I still think, you know, with the evidence of the Murata uh, win in, in, in Tokyo, I think he still has a lot of fight uh, left in him. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes back down to 160 pounds since he could uh, make 160 easily. He's always said, and this goes back to some of the <laughs> controversy about why did he never move up and challenge himself and everything. And he always said you know, he would move up if there was a big fight at 168. And, you know, Carl Froch at Wembley Stadium would have been a huge fight. It would have been 90,000 people there for that fight. At the time, you know, back when Julio Cesar Chavez was a hot uh, commodity, uh, that at 168 would have been huge with uh, all the Mexican fans that that would have brought out. But, you know, if there were no bigger fights at 168, 
you know, and, and actually the third uh, Canelo fight at 168, Canelo being the unified uh, champion 168 might, made a lot of sense. Undisputed, yeah. 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 Uh, undisputed, right, not unified, <laughs> undisputed. Um, that made a lot of sense, even though, you know, I think it's pretty clear that Canelo waited uh, much longer than oh, yeah. needed to. Uh, when I think when Gennady turned 40, all of a sudden, Canelo said, okay, <laughs> well, I'll fight him now. But now they're all calling him out. Everybody yeah. at 160 has been calling them out. You know, it's fun how that works. Losing their pen at, uh, right. you know, uh, what, four or five, six years ago now, 40 years old now, people think that, uh, you know, Gennady is vulnerable. And uh, like I said, I think uh, when you look at the training camp, when you look at the sparring and everything like that, he's still at uh, a very high level in the sport of boxing and could be maybe, he can't be Canelo at this point, but probably 95 percent of the other fighters he, right. could, uh, he could beat which is saying which is saying a lot when you put him when you start comparing him like you said to a monzone or to Hagler and, and everything and just the the length of time if you remember i started working with uh, triple g when he was 30 years old so we didn't have a lot of time it wasn't like he was 22 23 and we had time to kind of build his develop career. him especially over here in the United States. That's why there was so much time pressure to make those fights when uh, Sergio Martinez was considered the best middleweight champion or Felix Sturm at the time, and we were trying to put pressure on uh, on those fights. And uh, it just kind of happened where he became a mandatory for Sergio. Sergio fought uh, Cotto. Cotto right. won. Then we allowed that fight to go through where he fought Canelo, and we were guaranteed the winner of uh, Cotto Canelo, which is which it was not only the biggest fight in middleweight, but the biggest fight in the sport of boxing at that time. And um, that's when famously um, Canelo had decided to go back down to 154 and vacate the, oh, the 60 pound 155. Fight. <laughs> 155. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. That was the Liam Smith fight, but. Um, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, but uh, if you look at everything uh, in, in perspective, I think Triple G has had one of the best careers um, that you can say in the, the, the number of title defenses he has at middleweight and uh, just the length uh, of time that he's been fighting at that high level. I think, uh, you know, I was talking to Doug Fisher and the length of time, the number of weeks he's been in the top 10 ring magazine ratings, and it took him a while to get in there. Uh, mm -hmm. But... Um, he, the length of time he's been in the top 10 ring magazine ratings is, is a historic, uh, yeah. a historic run. Absolutely. Well, yeah, he's definitely going back down to 160. I hope that we see him in some big fights there, uh, before he hangs it up. Um, apparently the contract with the zone is up and now he's kind of a free agent. So he's got options. Um, but I want to talk about 360 promotions. Uh, you have a card coming up uh, next month, Sergei Bohachuk. I think it's November 3rd. And you guys now, and uh, Cal Walsh is on that too. I know you're really excited about him. Uh, Tom, we lost your picture here. Paging Tom. Oh, there we go. Okay. You, you went out for just a minute there. Um, it's, it's in Montebello. And I know originally you were doing these cards in Hollywood, but you found a new home in Montebello. You've had a, several of them there now. Uh, talk a little bit about that card. And Sergei, uh, of course, being from Ukraine, everything that's going on over there, I know he's been heavily affected by uh, all of that and just where he's at and what to expect. Well, just to touch on uh, the uh, Hollywood Fight Night shows, um, we've done a deal with uh, Dana White and UFC Fight Pass, and we're excited about that. We're excited about building boxing on the UFC Fight Pass platform. It's an international platform when there's fighters like Callum Walsh from Ireland, when Surya Bochuk from Ukraine, you know, a lot of international fighters. Um, you know, the, the, those shows can be seen all over the world. On that fight pass platform they have not only our boxing shows but tons of uh, content uh jujitsu mma uh shows all, a lot of the old uh ufc shows and uh it's it's a great platform and so i'm happy with the relationship um we've developed with dana i've known him for quite a while now and it's the first time this year that we've actually started uh doing boxing together and um uh, it's going really well we've we got a, cool. a good rating uh, on the platform uh, for boxing in the last show and now we have the November 3rd show coming up 
And like you said, we started at the Avalon. That's how we started calling it Hollywood Fight Nights because it was in a Hollywood nightclub. Right. Um, with the pandemic. I remember that first one. Yeah. Barely. Yeah, fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fun good stuff. times. You know, boxing in a in a nightclub uh, with the. Uh, it was dangerous, boots. man. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of dangerous, but uh, uh, we we outgrew it with the pandemic because it was really it was, we were sold out uh, pretty much every show. But uh, it it wasn't a large. Uh, it was a great venue in terms of sight lines and everything like that. And it had the electronic boards and it had the mm -hmm. nightclub feeling and everything to it. But uh, we moved to the Quiet Cannon at the Montebello Country Club, which is kind of like the best of both worlds. It's you know overlooking a golf course. Um, there's a huge uh, boxing fan base out that way uh, towards oh, yeah. East Bay, Montebello, Whittier, El Monte. You know, uh, Ben Lira from uh, South El Monte is uh, Steve Kim close by. Steve Kim <laughs> is close by. Mario yeah. Lopez is from um, you know, originally from out that way. So um, we get a lot of support out there. Uh, we've sold out the shows there at the at the Quiet Cannon, and. Um, uh, like I said, we're getting great uh, ratings on UFC Fight Pass, so we're excited about that. Callum Walsh, uh, we had just signed him this year. Uh, he's 4-0. He's, he's going into his fifth fight fighting uh, Dallin Parsley, who's 13-1. and So he knows if he's headlining these UFC Fight Pass shows, uh, he's got to really fight a good competition. And I'd say Callum, uh, with the Irish fan base and all the publicity we've done on our side and the boxing side, plus the UFC uh, uh, media and promotion that they've put behind him. Uh, he's one of the best known fighters, uh, especially uh, one of the young fighters coming up. He's only 21 years old. He's a six time Irish national champion. He's a European gold medalist. So he has the amateur pedigree, trains with Freddie Roach at the Wildcard Gym, gets tons of sparring down there at Wildcard, really high level sparring. And um, we're excited about him. Uh, Surrey Bochuk, I'm actually wearing a shirt that Surrey gave me when he got. He's, I don't know if you can see this on there, yeah. but, uh, and you got Vitaly, the mayor of uh, Kiev. He's in the background there, uh, always keeping uh, Vitaly and Vladimir in our in our uh, thoughts and prayers with what they're going through over there in uh, Ukraine. But uh, Sergei was there uh, just waiting on his visa to come back here, and then the war broke out, and then he was uh, literally stuck in a war zone uh for about eight months um and then he finally got special permission from the uh, ukrainian government to uh to go and, and continue with his boxing career and represent the country of ukraine in the boxing ring rather than on the front lines his uh, brother is fighting in the military and and when he left his city of uh, venezia uh it got bombed by russian missiles uh, two days later so wow. um he had to go across the border he was in poland then he was waiting for his visa over there, and they finally get, got uh, back here to uh, L.A. and then uh, started training again. And then he asked, uh, you know, we had that November sh 3rd show planned. And then he asked, uh, since he'd been out of the ring for so long, he asked if he could be on that show. And so we agreed to put him on the show just to pretty much support him and, you know, fighting for his country of Ukraine. So uh, that'll be a great, that's a great fight. Um, he's fighting uh, Aaron Coley. Who's a very tough guy, 16 and four, but three of those four losses were in split decisions. Close uh, um, so very, very competitive uh, fighter. Uh, that's going to be for the WBC Continental America, Continental America's title at uh, super welterweight. So both uh, uh, Callum Walsh and Sergey Bochuk uh, are fighting at uh, super welterweight. And um, uh, this this will be a fun show. Uh, Omar Trinidad is on the show. Uh, Chantel Navarro, who's, uh, I don't know, you remember the Navarro brothers, remember uh, mm -hmm. Carlos Navarro, Jose Navarro, and uh, Nacho Navarro, and uh, uh, Chantel is Nacho's uh, daughter, and she's actually now, she's, uh, I think she's a six-time national champion uh, amateur, and uh, she brings out a lot of fans. She's an official Nike athlete. We helped her get that deal with cool. uh, with Nike, and uh yeah, those are those are fun shows, and they sell out. I uh, tell you, Mike, if you have anyone asking you about the shows, tell them to get their tickets quick because we've sold out every show now uh, at the Country Club, and there's about a hundred tickets left, um, which will go pretty fast over those the next. Those are gonna go for sure next month. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be busy uh, on that day, but I definitely want to get out to one uh, early next year once the uh, once my daughter is. Um, at least a few months old and I can get out there. I think that'd, that'd be, be cool. a lot of fun. 
We've got, uh, you know, with uh, UFC Fight Pass, we've got some some dates planned already, and uh, there'll be okay. a couple early uh, uh, next year. And, um, yeah, cool. definitely need to get you back out here and uh, reunited with the, the old crew. Yeah, man, it's, it's been a while. So that, let's definitely plan on that, and that would be a lot of fun.